All right, before we start, I just have one quick announcement. The videos for yesterday's talks are all up on YouTube and I am posting the link there right now for everyone. All right, there it is. So now with the last talk of the day, we are running about 10 minutes late, but there is no session after our session. So you can take 10, 12 minutes more after the hour. So our speaker is Andrew Gravel from the University of Montreal, and he will tell us about degree points on planar curves. Go ahead. Thank you, Florian. Is that um, full screen? Can you see full screen? Uh, no, no, full screen. We don't see Try full that. screen. We just see like a, a PDF. Okay. I'm clicking on resume share, but it doesn't want to do it. <sighs> it looks fine though. Okay, am I moving? No. Everything's no, you're not moving. Yet. I think you should reshare it and maybe reshare your entire uh, screen. Not yeah, just it's all going wrong. Yeah. I don't know what's happening. Seems like a, a lot of talks have had technical problems at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you see that? No. We can see you. Okay, we're going to get there, I promise. <laughs> uh, let's try one more time. If this fails, I'll use a different uh, PDF file. Uh, I'm just trying to use Adobe Acrobat Robin Preview, which seems to sometimes not be a happy thing. Okay, you can see it again, yeah? Yeah, we can see the PDF file. It's uh, not full screen. But, uh, I'll try and go to full screen mode. Okay. And now it's sharing paused. Ah. Resume share. Doesn't want to resume share. Ah. You, should, you should give new share. That's frustrating. Okay, well, it's going to have to be in this form, I guess. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Um, yeah, it's sorry. fine. That's okay, good. well, thanks for the invitation. Um, some of you may have heard me give this talk in French a few weeks ago at a meeting with Canadian Math Society. This is pretty similar, but minor a few minor differences. So this is joint work with Leah Benish, who's a postdoc yeah. here in uh, Montreal. And um, well, I think it's always best to start for an example. So what I'm going to be looking for are rational points on the curve, x squared plus y squared plus one equals zero. And I think it's pretty easy to see there's no rational points because, well, I mean, Everything on the left-hand side is greater than or equal to zero if you put in any real number. And um, well, if you want them to equal zero, they better all be zero then, but one of them's one, so that's not possible. So there are no rational points. So let's go to degree two fields and ask, are there any points in degree two fields? So here's an easy one. I can just take um, any integer m and put it in for y. And then I just need x to be the square root of minus m squared minus one so i've got a point in some field and in fact you can easily oh it's not hard to prove it this gives you infinitely many distinct um imaginary quadratic fields for which there are um rational points so we start this is starting in our area that we're there's no rational points but in fields of degree two we can find infinitely many points of if you like degree two i'm going to think of those as degree two points and actually this is a bit away, from, not entirely relevant to my point, but it's kind of fun. Let's just see if we can find all of the um, fields q root d where there are rational points. So if I just take x as u plus v root d and y as t minus w root d for arbitrary rationals, u, v, t, w, and arbitrary d. Um, then, and we know d is going to be negative from what we said a minute ago, but um, to cancel the coefficient of the root d, we're going to need u, v equals t, w. So when we just expand this, we've got, well, just take the real part, we've got u squared, dv squared, t squared, and dw squared. Um, so then if I just take this and multiply through by v squared, and then I use the substitution uv equals dw to get rid of the first term, there's a beautiful factorization that takes place. So um, we're starting to move somewhere. Um, so the next thing I'll do is just multiply through by this w squared v squared, so I make a square there. That means I can multiply that square into the t squared and into the v squared. I've got the w squared v squared on the other side, and I just expand that to be minus two squares. 
And so when I reorganize all that, I get this. I'm doing it quickly, but I hope you can see principle I'm doing nothing but reorganization. So if I divide through by the V squared, what I've shown is if there is a solution um, in Q root D, then minus D can be written as the sum of three squares of rational numbers. And it's not, comp well, we, it's not complicated to prove that a number can be the sum of uh, three squares of rational numbers if and only if it's the sum of three squares of integers. Um, this is just from classification of what those numbers are and simple congruences. You don't need gen genus theory. Um, and so we're saying that if there, are, if there is a solution, then minus D must be the sum of three squares of integers. And actually, um, once you just write that down, it's very, it takes you five minutes to realize we can just go straight to a parameterized solution. So um, it's, it's very beautiful here. You can um, classify all the D here as being those D that, uh, for which minus D can be written as sum of three squares. It was the genre of Lagrange, which ever one who classified that. As I showed this to uh, my colleague, Henri Damont. He showed me this very beautiful proof to do this using quaternions. Um, I think there's probably more than several ways to do it. One way you don't want to do it, by the way, is using um, the obvious Hasse-Minkowski theorem here, because trying to understand the quadratic residue symbols in Q root D in order to use it is actually a real pain. Anyway, let me go to the main topic, which is um, I'm going to take smooth irreducible curve defined over a number field K of genus G, so just some curve. And let's just talk about what rational points we know about. So um, first thing to know is that in genus zero, um, it's essentially polynomial solutions and either there isn't a solution or there's infinitely many given by polynomials and that is uh, fairly fun to prove. Um, and then the, the genus one is, of course, corresponds to elliptic curves. And the great result of Morel shows that no matter what number field you're in, well, this is a little different from the statement of Morel. This is, if you like, a corollary, but um, it captures a lot of it. If there's finitely many points, either the curve has rank zero in that field, then actually you can bound the number of points um, on the curve in that field by a bound that depends only on K. So it doesn't depend on the curve itself, or otherwise the, uh, there's an infinitely many K rational points. And actually Perron, who I think may have been a student of Morel, showed that the dependence here actually is not just on the field. You can do much better and just say it's, it depends only on the, the degree of a field over the rationals. So this will be slightly relevant in a minute. So of course the great theorem in rational points is Fulting's theorem, which says, well, we've done genus zero and genus one here. If genus is greater than one, you've got finitely many points. And by now we have um, at least three very distinct proofs from Fultings, Voiter, and, uh, and Venkatesh and Lawrence. Um, but we still are asking the same basic question is, can we bound the number of points? We know it's finite, but is it finite? Well, it doesn't matter about the curve. It only depends on the field, or maybe the, I should put the genus too, curve and genus. Or is there a bound that depends, like Perron's bound, only on the degree of a field in the genus? There should be. We, we, we feel in our hearts there should be. And um, I don't know if anybody's got any sensible ideas to attack this sort of problem. So with faulting many of these proofs, you can sort of bound all future solutions in terms of solutions you've already got. Um, so they're sort of non-constructive in that sense. Or if they are constructive, it's, it, it gives room for quite a lot of solutions. Um, and a bit complicated to put your hand on what, what that lot of solutions means. I'll explain a little bit about that more in a minute. But going back to what I did of x squared plus y squared plus one equals zero, what I'm interested in is how many points are, of, are there of degree m. So we saw if x squared plus y squared plus one equals zero, then none of degree um, one, and then there's um, infinitely many of degree two in all those quadratic fields. So here we're going to look at the points that have degree m over the base field. Above, we've discussed here the points of degree one over the base field. That's just the number of points on the curve. But as soon as you go to degree two, of course, there's infinitely many fields. So it's a much bigger object that you're looking at. Um, so it seems like a deeper question, at least, once m is greater than root to two. So there's that definition again. Um, and I'm going to, I'm sorry, there's a bit of definitions. There are two sets. I firstly, I want to know for which m there actually is a point in here. So you might have points. Um, that are in K, you just can't have infinitely many if your genus is greater than one. Um, but I wanna know if there are or, or for what M there are points. 
And then for many M, we might now expect just from that one example that for many M, there are infinitely many points. So I'm going to have DC is the, the Ds where um, the, so the degrees of extensions where you do have some rational points, and here's where you have infinitely many. So we want to understand these sets. And there's an amazing theorem that's just quite old now, over 25 years, by Devarim Klassen, who showed that if you take a planar curve, um, which has degree greater than or equal to seven, and there are infinitely many points of degree m in fields of degree m, then m must be bigger than d minus, greater than or equal to d minus one. So for instance, um, if you had a degree seven um, curve, then the number of rational points of degree one, two, three, four, and five is finite. Kind of a remarkable, remarkable result. And um, quite recently, um, Smith and Isabel Vogt proved that um, there is a similar result for curves drawn on certain other surfaces. So I didn't, I can't really understand, it's beyond me some of this stuff, but it, something about the proof depends on where you draw these curves, which seems surprising to me. Um, so let's go on a bit. And um, the, uh, there has been some wonderful work recently um, by uh, Dimitrov, um, Gao, and Haberger on upper bounds for the number of points uh, in a given number field on a curve. And, but I, I wanted to highlight a wonderful preprint um, six weeks ago by Tangle Ge, who proves that if there's no morphisms from C um, down to, of degree two, down to curves of genus zero or one, then actually he can give a bound on um, all of the, the number of degree two points over all field extensions of degree two. So there's some constant that depends on the genus and the degree of a field extension over rationals. And here's the bit that sort of come, seems to come into a lot of the proofs that are around of, of sort things is you've got something that depends on the rank of a Jacobian. Um, so, but now there's this universal bound that you may know that, um, you know, for a while these Chebati type proofs you had, I don't know if the rank had to be less than the genus, I think it was, um, but anyway, there, there is progress, but it's a wonderful, wonderful result. It may not be quite as much as we think, but it's clearly a wonderful result. So let's go back to my simple example. We uh, know there's no real points, and um, we know that for every point you get a complex conjugate to go with it. Um, so essentially that tells us that two must divide um, the field extension that P belongs to, the degree. So if you do have a points of degree M, then two would have to divide M. So it's sort of a Gower theory type argument. Um, and on the other hand, we can actually show that there's lots of degree two points. I'm just, I want to show you a technique that we will use in much greater generality. So we're just going to substitute in for X and Y. And if we substitute in just general linear polynomials, this doesn't look linear, quite general, but you know, um, you can always do a linear transformation on, on, on these variables on T. So you've got to lose two variables in, when you're trying to be general. Um, but anyway, so when I substitute these two in into this formula, I just get some equation for T. And um, if this is irreducible, that will give me a degree two point, right? I just take the degree two value of T and plug it in. That gives me a degree two point. Does that by irreducible irreducibility, basically anything like this, um, for almost all choices of A and B, you're going to have irreducibility. As it happens in this case, it's always, but this is a very special thing. Um, so what we've shown here, well, it's my sort of second proof that there are, um, there are infinitely many degree two extensions that have points. So in my set DC infinity, that means that these are the, the degrees that have infinitely many points. So um, we remember the, the only condition we have so far is two divides M. So we know there's infinitely many points of degree two. How about points of degree four? Well, I can just play the same game, but instead of putting generic polynomials of degree one in, I just put generic polynomials of degree two. I can get six by generic polynomials of degree three, making the right arguments. So actually what we can prove is the, the um, set of integers for which there are infinitely many rational points of degree M are exactly the even integers, so two times the integers. Okay, so um, one can ask a, a general question of this sort. Here's the definitions again here. I'm going to do something a little odd, which is I'm going to take all the points, all the values of um, the uh, degrees in which there is a point of degree M, and I'm going to take a GCD, which at first sight looks ridiculous, but um, well, the amazing result um, 
that was sort of known, but 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 sort of done in the right generality by Clark Milosevic and Pollock um, just quite recently, is that the set of M values for which you do get infinitely many points is actually everything div divisible by that GCD minus a finite exceptional set. So E of C is very, um, I forgot to define it, but I just mean a finite exceptional set. So in the example, I'll go back one slide yeah. here. I've got the GCD is two times the integers minus an exceptional set, which happens to be empty. So we just saw an example. Um, Lee and I gave some more examples, which one can just construct out a little bit of elementary Galois theory. If but a polynomial degree n, the reduction in FPT is, is irreducible. Somehow you can play that with that. And uh, in this case, the uh, GCD will be n, and you'll just get something very, very neat. So um, you, know, you can do this thing of trying to exhaustively find uh, examples that fit all the possible things left after your theorem. So this fits in a lot of theorems. Um, so um, there's another way to define this GCD. Um, it turns out it's the smallest degree of a k-rational divisor on k. And one thing to note is that uh, the meromorphic differential on, on C of genus G, um, the divisor of that has degree 2G minus 2. And so we know this GCD must divide, well, because this index must divide 2G minus 2. Um, and obviously 2g minus 2 is, is not helpful if g is 1, but for g greater than 1, this is interesting. Um, in fact, the index is usually 2g minus 2. This comes from a rather deeper algebraic geometric theorem, which I'm not competent to go into. Um, but let's just have a look at planar curves of degree d, which have no singularities, which is one I want to play with. So these have genus, as you may remember from whatever class of this thing. And then if I look at this 2g minus 2 formula, it's d times d minus 3. But remember, if I just take a curve of degree d, I plug in linear polynomials for x and y, then I'm going to have a degree d polynomial in t generically. So I know d is in the set. We know that there are going to be points, infinitely many points of degree d. So the right answer for the, um, the g of c, oops, is, um, well, it's a divisor of d times d minus 3. In fact, it's going to be smaller than d. So the sort of generic curve doesn't apply here, the result of the generic curve. I mean, we know planar curves aren't generic, but, but I'm just saying that, that, you know, you might've guessed maybe that little hole there, but it really doesn't. Okay, so let's go back to this. So um, we have this nice result, as I said, and the sort of result that Leah and I are going to prove is that if you look at all the points of degree M, um, the, the, um, that live, um, you know, algebraic points on the curve. And we're going to run the discriminant associated with the point. Um, so that's the definition up to x. Then you get more than x to some power number of points. So there have been some results like this in, in rather special cases, like uh, hyperelliptic curves and things by Benish and, and some of the collaborators, and also um, Lemke Oliver and a few other people. Um, so um, let me get into sort of some of the fun stuff you can do with this problem. So, I mean, so our main contribution here really, although it's not as general as this because we're working with planar curves, is that we're showing that, well, the number of such fields is like X to a power. So what we're managing to show is that you get a lower bound of X some power. So now the only thing in real dispute is what's the power of X. And let me just say our, our, our power will be nowhere near the correct power of X. So here's sort of a fun way you can play with this game. Um, so um, if, we, um, if we have a degree D curve, we can generically substitute in XT and YT, and, which are linear, and get, um, you know, get what, get points. And, um, oops. So um, these substitutions can be thought of as morphisms from C to P1, and the k gonality is the smallest degree n of a morphism of a map from C to P1 defined over k. Um, and then that degree is actually in our, our set of degrees for infinite many points from the same time of construction. And because of this, we know that n is less than or equal to d. Um, so yeah, so Frey in 1994 made this, was able to prove the following, that if m is the minimal degree 
we have an infinite set and n is the k-gonality of c then m is between n and 2m and if you like he didn't make any conjectures to the correct values He's, he gave some examples where n equals m and some where n equals 2m so i conjectured to myself well it must be n equals m or equals 2m and again smith invoked proof well then i was completely wrong that there's examples for each value of m so kind of cool that makes this a little harder than one might have thought um anyway let me let me show you a typical way you can proceed it's not exactly deep mathematics so let's have a look at this curve x to the eight plus blah 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 it does have a singularity at zero zero one i'm really not very concerned about singularities um they can be dealt with but um i did bring it up so i'm just going to plug in a polynomial x of degree r and a polynomial y of degree s um and what am i going to do i'm going to get when I do that, the, the degrees of the monomials are 8R, 4R plus 3S, and 5S. And assuming there's no cancellation, um, this will be the degree. And generically, this will be the degree because you can have leading coefficients. Um, so though if for each of those, we know if this polynomial has degree D, then we're going to get infinitely many um, rational points on the curve of that degree. We're using Hilbert irreducibility. So let's see, using this formula, we get any multiple of eight, because we just plug it, we take, and if we want 16, we take r equals two and s equals zero. If we want 15, we take r equals zero and s equals three. Um, so yeah, we, we know we can get any multiple of five or eight, but can we get other integers? And we can hope to get them from four r plus three s to be maximal. Well, we need it bigger than the other two. So eight r bigger than four r plus three s. And the two conditions become this, which become these conditions. So we can get anything in set 4R plus 3S where this is the case. And notice here, we're not doing anything it's doing, except doing a substitution, doing some elementary number theory. And when you do this, well, I'm, I wrote some technicality, no point. You find that you can get every integer bigger than 94 is in the set, greater than or equal to 94. So we know everything from 94 onwards, there are infinitely many rational points in degrees, degrees, fields of degree 94, 95, 96, et cetera. Um, but actually we can do a little better than that with the same example. So um, we can just do a, a change of variable. And here you see the dominant terms are always going to be, whatever you do when you plug in, it's gonna be this y to the fifth z cubed. So um, actually, that means the, the set of values here will be like 3a plus 5b when I put in a polynomial of degree a for z and degree b for y. And so if I run through the set, well, actually, this, this uh, year of lectures, it seems, I've talked quite a bit about the postage stamp problem. If you heard me talk about it, this is my favorite example. And um, in that example, it's easy enough to prove that you get every integer except 1, 2, 4, and 7. So that's a bit better than on the previous slide. And notice here, we have really not used any, any real ideas, just the simplest maps imaginable. Um, so um, this actually, we only use the degrees, at the highest degrees, so coefficients don't matter. So it's surprising how easy some of this is. Um, we know that one doesn't occur infinitely often. There's not infinite many points of degree one from faultings. Um, but um, I want to take this particular coefficients because we get, um, we do get one point of degree one, we get the one one point. And I wanna show you how we can use this in an interesting way. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna substitute in here, x is one plus t and y is one plus a t. And what you can see is if I take t equals zero, I'll go back to this point of degree one. So that means when I make the substitution into the polynomial, I will actually get a t will factor out and what's left is a polynomial of degree seven. So, and that's a, again, a generic polynomial, if you like, in a certain way. So what we end up with is that we've proved here that seven occurs infinitely often as the degree of a point. So what's rather cool is by getting one point of degree one, we get infinitely many points of degree seven. And if you go back to that the bar class in theorem I said, where they did, they said greater than or equal to D minus one, when you've got a degree D curve, if you've got a degree one point, it can give you infinitely many degree D minus one points. That's the trick. And basically that's as far as you can run that particular trick there is their point. Uh, maybe I won't get into the rest of this, but you can uh, play this game with other substitutions. So, okay, so technique one is just, just substitute, you know, the generic degree R and S polynomials in. And then technique two here is be a little cleverer more or less generic, but 
but force them to have a point you already know about. So you just work like in a congruence class. So if you like, it's an irreducible polynomial, divides f of ut, f of u, f of v. We know that. Um, and then you can simply say, okay, we'll run in a, so before I had one plus t, one plus at, which is kind of like one plus at, it's like running in a congruence class, one mod t. So this generalizes very nicely to irreducible polynomials, to getting higher degrees. Um, you can use Chinese remainder theorem, so you can do many polynomials at the same time. Um, I'm just, trust me, this is all, you know, some of these things, if you read it, you just say, yeah, yeah, that's trivial. Um, so, um, yeah, so what this means is that um, you can, well, I showed you, you could subtract the point of, of, of degree one, that degree from the polynomial, taking out a factor T, but if, also, if I had a point of degree two, I could remove that factor two, or I could move them together, one and a two, or I can move one several times. So you start to see where the GCD comes in. Basically, you can cover every congruence class um, A mod D, where D is the degree, where GCD divides A. So from this, you can quite easily deduce their theorem. Um, and um, I can't see even if you can. So um, I guess the, the main difference between our proofs is we both use linear algebra to prove our theorems. Um, they use riemann roch so um, it's linear algebra, but, but certain aspects are a little less explicit than you want um, if you're trying to be get some numbers from lower bounds. Here we just use linear algebra. Um, so yeah, you can be a little more explicit. So um, let me finish with, actually I meant to finish with an example I forgot to write down, but anyway, let me finish with hyperelliptic curves. So if I've got y squared equals f of x, um, with where fx has degree d, and irreducible, um, I can obviously subtract in any, uh, any um, well, let me start by putting in t for y. So now I've got t squared, and I'll put in an integer a for x, so t squared minus f of a. And as I vary a, I'm going to run through lots of fields. It's a bit like what we did of x squared plus y squared plus one equals zero. So here I've proved that actually degree two extensions happen infinitely often points of degree two. And I can go in the other direction and, and make the sort of thing that's varying the f of x, put in a at plus b, if you like. So we can prove that d um, occurs infinitely often. And then this GCD that's so important divides the GCD of 2 and d, because they're both in the set. So if d is odd, we know that from some point onwards, every integer will appear as the degree of infinitely many rational points of, degree, of that degree n. But, um, if D is even, it's a little more complicated. In fact, the example we saw at the beginning, x squared plus y squared plus one, we saw there are no odd degree, point, degree points. So two really was the thing. Um, but from that technique, I, that very simple technique I showed you with the Chinese remainder theorem and congruences, um, if you just have any point of, of odd degree, then not as a GC1, GCD1, but you can in the same way construct lots of points of arbitrary large degree. So, um, yeah, so I was. I just wanted to do the example, which I never worked out for myself, of, of what happens with elliptic curves. And from here, you can see we can get infinitely many of degree two, infinitely many of degree three, four, but then five's a question. So one would have to do something like, um, do something generic where you put in um, degree four polynomial into the y squared. And then you try and make sure that the, so you get a degree eight polynomial by putting a degree four polynomial into Y and say a degree two polynomial in for X, I'll get a degree eight polynomial, but I'm going to assure that it's divisible by degree three polynomial by the Chinese remainder theorem. And then I can get five in my set and thus get everything else. So I'm guessing that I unfortunately didn't work it out. I forgot, but I think that'll work for all elliptic curves. I'm not entirely sure. And this is actually somewhere where we vary a little bit from what the algebraic geometers would find interesting um, because they, they have a slightly different definition. But for higher genus curves, we, we match up in um, our statement. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.